involve a little more subtle kind of body position to movements, and they go over some things that are a little more like aggressive, I guess, or hardcore. Because um, I think what we're noticing with some of the things that we wanted to be subtle were being done a little more aggressively, and it was hard to move. So um, we're gonna kind of break down a couple different uh, basics. Cool? Okay, so we're gliding on the snow. Mm -hmm. So that's like probably number one rule. You're not, try not to lift your feet up, right? Um, there are times we'll go over some stuff when you are lifting your feet up, technique-wise, but for the most part, we're trying to glide on the snow, and our goal is to kind of push ourselves up the hill or across the snow. Um, so we're gonna talk about how to do that efficiently. Um, so we'll start at the top. So basically, as you're walking along, head is always up. Big mistake we see with beginners is looking down or kind of like turtling, especially when you're getting tired or you're crying. Um, <laughs> so, so, so you always want to be looking ahead of you. Um, and that's important terrain-wise, but it's also important because your neck positioning dictates how you use your shoulders. Um, and in terms of one of the more aggressive maneuvers that we're doing, we need to use our shoulders a lot and pretty powerfully. So you need to make sure your head is up pretty much at all times, unless you're having a gear thing. Um, okay, so it's pretty simple, looking ahead of you. No drooping head, no turtling um, to start. Uh, we also need our chest up, okay? So a lot of times when our head's forward, we're happy, struggling to breathe, we're collapsing down and huffing and puffing. But to breathe correctly, you need to be chest up, okay? Um, and we'll talk about how as we move uphill that changes a little bit because we don't want to keep ourselves so upright that we're falling down the hill, okay? But chest subtly up. Um, we want our core engaged and we want to be able to belly breathe, okay? Um, do you guys all feel like you can do the kind of lower core tough belly breathe combo? Cool. If not, practice it on a flat, practice it when you're not short of breath, but try not to be taking deep breaths in through your chest. Um, try city belly breaths. Uh, Janelle had a push the tush cue, is that, was that it? Okay, so to help you kind of tuck in here and engage your lower core, we can push the tush. Push, push the bush. Push the bush. <laughs> <laughs> Tuck the tush, push Tuck the push. Push. <laughs> uh, This is falling under the subtle category because what I noticed last time was that people were pushing their bushes so hard <laughs> that they were like, wait, I can't. <laughs> <laughs> it's a subtle kind of tuck, soft tuck in the bush area. <laughs> Engaged, but you're soft because if you think about it, you know, everything I told you is to be kind of still and tall up here, right? Not collapse forward, but your legs still need to move under you, right? So we can't really glide with our legs if we're push tushing like this. <laughs> That's a subtle push tush. So, Mona, what are you thinking about when you're belly breathing? That's a good question. So, here's what I found everyone's cue is a little different. Right, so you kind of have to find what works for you. For me, as a physical therapist, I can kind of just think that balloon, like breathing in and out using this area versus like up here. Um, I was just out with my sister-in-law um, last weekend and we made them do a lot of vertical that they weren't used to. Um, so they were struggling, but the cool thing was she had a lot of work to practice her technique. And for her, her breathing actually improved when she, her mantra was just look at the trees because she would hunch over so badly that she like, couldn't breathe. So for her, as soon as she kept her like, chest up, eyes up on the trees, she could belly breathe without even thinking about it. So I think it's a little bit of the cue that, that works for you. Um, do you guys, do you feel like you know how to belly breathe? To be doing like the diaphragm breathing like exercise? Yeah, we can do that. So basically, if you put one hand on your chest, one hand on your, oh, one hand on your belly. Yep. So you want to keep your chest tall but still, and you want your breathing to come in and out from your diaphragm, which means you're going to open and close or poop your belly out and pull it in. And then everyone will see my gut. <laughs> I can't just like suck it. In. <laughs> But that, it, so that's like kind of your steady rhythm as you're going, but it's subtle, right? So you're not actually trying to push it out. It's just for the demonstration that that's how you should be breathing, right? But then you're kind of matching it with your pace and your rhythm. Yeah. So play around with it. For me, if that's all I think about, everything else kind of falls into place. For Allie, the other weekend, she had to think about her chest or it couldn't fall into place. Yeah. Um, but we can talk about that as we go up, because I think some people last time were push-pushing so hard that they couldn't breathe and use their, so. Does that make sense? You just kind of have to find that flow and that mantra. And we can definitely talk about it if you guys are not sure about what that is for you. 
Um, so those are kind of the subtle things. Um, Marie, uh, my boss brought up a great point before about kind of the ski jumper position. So if you're just skinning on a flat, you're pretty upright, um, which is relatively easy, okay? As you're traveling uphill, right, and the slope starts, if you stayed in that upright position, you would tip yourself backwards, right? And you lose efficiency because you're trying to move forwards and upwards, right? So that ski jumper that Maureen uh, talked about was a good visual where you're going to create a slight lean forward as you move uphill. Um, so that has to be done without flexing your hips, okay? So that's going to come from your lower body, um, which we'll talk about in a minute, and from the way that you plant your poles, which we're going to talk about next, okay? Um, any questions so far? Does that all make sense about this other stuff? Okay. Um, so poles are a biggie. Um, Janelle and I both believe that poles are super underused, which is definitely not good because they should be really used. Like, I think 30% of your power coming from your poles, okay? Um, which I think is probably maybe a misconception that a beginner might have because you think you're walking up the hill, okay? But we're using our poles a ton. Um, that being said, I think another big mistake we see for beginners is having poles that are way too short, okay? Um, so there's two problems, two main problems with that. So if we're going to really drive with our pole, so we're going to plant our pole near our boot and then push back using your lap, so it's an arm motion. Uh, if your pole is too short, you can't really do that and you're, you're going to get dragged down if you try, okay? So you lose that power. Uh, also, if your pole is too short, so let's say mine were down here, people end up doing what I call the Eeyore, where you're like going side to side to get your pole plant down, okay? Again, if you're trying to move uphill, but all your energy is lost going side to side, you're not going to get good efficiency moving up, okay? So either you got to get your poles taller, and I was using armpits uh, as a good landmark, or you got to get new poles, because a lot of people have um, their resort poles and they're too short. So something to think about, but um, what we did last session was anyone who felt like their poles are too short, um, I traded, and you got to feel what it feels like to pull plant with a pole that's actually taller, and it feels really good. Um, armpit for going up. I also like to kind of think of like having the pole in your like in your sports bra. So have it be long as like you know some poles are at the bottom of the sports bra, some are at the top. It kind of depends on your comfort level, but you do want to have a longer pole for going uphill. Otherwise, you just don't have the efficient. You can't use your poles for efficiency to move uphill. You're basically what I call lily dipping. If you've ever been in a canoe, uh -huh. where you're just kind of sticking like sticking in the water, but you're not actually helping yeah. propel yourself forward. It's the same with pulling. We'll practice something okay. out there that you'll really see the difference. So as we get our clothes back on and get ready, if you have poles that have the ability to adjust, adjust them to mm -hmm. about your armpits. Yeah. And to your point, um, we talked about this last time. Remember, we were talking about just a few yeah. moments ago, not pushing your yourself backwards as you go uphill. So as you do travel uphill, you're still using that pole, but you're going to need a little further back. So the poles, if they're tall, they're not pushing you back. You're pushing your pole to help you. Um, it's so overlooked and it's so important. Um, then, can we just mention where you plant your pole and why? Um, when, when you're going uphill, it's pretty common to see people kind of plant right in front of their toes. Where's all the energy going if you really engage your core and use your arms and push down? Where's that energy going? Down. 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 It's not helping you at all. So think about having your pole at a slight angle and landing in the middle to the heel of your foot. And then if I put energy into it, I'm engaging my lat. I mean, I'm sorry. This is my lat. My <laughs> obliques. My lat. I'm engaging all of this. So it comes from the core and it comes from like a little micro, like, crunch. So it's not just yeah. So I was like actually engaging all of this. So all this gets tight, this gets tight, and you can really push down, land your pole, and help you propel you forward. Yeah. It's awesome once you get the hang of it. And then to Janelle's point, you're engaging your core. When your core is stable, it stabilizes your hips. Right? Imagine doing that your and you have hip and knee problems, and they're just crunching it in the whole time, 3,000 vertical, going like this, like your knee's going to hurt, right? So that core stabilization that comes from the proper drive stabilizes down the whole chain. It's really cool. So we'll have you guys practice that, for sure. Um, OK. Anything else with arms? So you kind of mentioned you're not really nillying like we're, we're using our arms. Yeah. Your lats are very great. And with that being said, we all have pull straps most of the time on our poles. And with those pull straps, you want to take your hand and go up through the bottom. And then when you bring it down, see how it cradles your wrist? 
This right here also helps you use the entire upper body so you're not using all your grip strength because if you hold on with your, too tight with your hands, you lose circulation and your hands get cold. So if you can just relax your hands, they sit there, but you don't really need to grip too much and then you can use the straps to help support your body weight as you go uphill. Cool. Any questions? Anything else? So I can think about the moment. Okay. Um, all right, so the core, kind of the most important thing, chest up, we're gonna engage our core a lot by using our arms and getting that slight tuck here. Um, that's important so that we don't do this, okay? But we need to have our tuck kind of loose enough so that we can move our hips under us. So that's like the next really important concept. Um, I think a lot of us tend to kind of hike up the hill, okay? Um, and that burns your hip flexors up. So we need to learn to use our glutes to kind of push ourselves uphill, okay? Um, and as I said, if you're using your poles correctly, you're gonna get a lot of hip stability and you're gonna have better power to push forward using your hips, okay? Um, but we wanna think about kind of having this drive that comes from extending our hip behind us. Our knee will extend, our foot's gonna go, or our ankle, I should say, is gonna go from a flex position and it's gonna push us forward, okay? So for a lot of people, their, their kind of mantra, if we're talking about that, needs to be to kind of use their glutes or to kind of push and glide versus just like jam our hips uphill. I think that's kind of what you were referring to with your old skinny technique. Yeah. My old skinny technique, I had a completely flat butt and I worked out all the time, but I didn't know that my glutes, I didn't really know I had them. <laughs> no, I just shoved them in pants. And so I did everything from my hip flexors, which wore them out. So if you want a really nice glute, that's butt, look good in those jeans, skin up Snow King, that's the proper <laughs> technique, and you'll fill those pants out nice. <laughs> we'll go over this particular move on the steeper slope. It's really hard to demonstrate on a flat, on the flat ground. Yeah, it'll make a little more sense for moving. Um, so one more thing, I think for lower extremity, um, we want to be careful. So we're just telling you like, like glide, push up hill, right? However, you don't want to overstride. So that leads to a lot of knee injuries. And it's hard to control your lower leg. And when people are overstriding, especially when we're tired, and especially with women who have wider hips, we see a lot of stress that kind of your knee falls inward, especially if you're on a tricky side hill. Um, so if you're overextending here and falling in, you're gonna have a lot of torsion across your knee and you're not gonna be able to use that glide properly. So we wanna get used to kind of moving fast. Like if you're running, like at a higher cadence, okay? Activating the glutes without overstriding. Does that make sense? And I guess some of the stuff is harder to do with yours, but we'll practice that as soon as we get outside. Mona's gonna show us what I'll run the hill. <laughs> okay. I like story. Um, so I think, um, in thinking about um, a couple of things, I think the biggest thing for you guys is to think about what you do kind of poorly, I guess. Like where, you know, all right, I'm really good with breathing, I'm really good at keeping my chest up, but man, like I really do the your. And focusing on a couple of things that you can improve because there are a lot of components. And I think if you kind of just can do a little self-analysis, use us for some help, and then focus on the things you need help with. Um, practice those things, and then developing, like my sister-in-law just did, the mantra that works for you. So you can kind of just have that in your head, think about it, practice. Because um, I think for all of us, it's a little different. But I want everyone to just become familiar with your boots. There's a walk in a tour mode. If you're in rental boots or your boots are new, um, just kind of get an idea of where that is. Oftentimes it's up on the back. Like for example, mine, this is my ski. It gets tight, it gets locked, and this is my walk. So make sure your boot is in walk mode. And then when it comes to all the straps on your boot, you want them to be really loose. You don't want them to be like flopping around, but you don't want to have any of those levers cranked down. Because you want to have lots of motion. Lots of ankle. Yep. Okay, and then the other thing is most, well, all of us are in tech bindings, which basically means you have holes in the front and you have these pens. There's different types of bindings. Some are super nice, you can just step in and you're good to go. Some aren't as easy. I find it if I line up one hole, then I can find the other one, line it up, and then roll my foot and it will lock in there. And then once it locks, you take this little lever and you pull it to its highest setting and then your foot is locked into your ski. This is a different style of binding. I actually have to push it down 
to get my foot in, but same thing, pull this up to lock. That way my ski will accidentally come off as I'm going to pull. I didn't know that. On the back, you should pull them and step on. <laughs> That's what I do. And then on the back, you have a couple options. This is flat, so you're, you know, when you're going on a cat track or just flat, this I have to turn sideways to be flat. And then to have a little bit of heel rise, turn it this way, or you flip one down or two. I actually don't advise using the highest setting because biomechanically I don't think it's good for you. And if you're going on the highest setting, you're probably gonna start skinning up something too steep and then you're gonna start hurting your hip flexors. So I actually don't recommend ever using that one. So it's either this one or flat. And then once you get to the top and you're all excited to go downhill, you obviously have to, well, <laughs> you can do it with your skis on, which I think is pro. <laughs> but we'll, we'll, we'll start by doing it this way. I'll take my foot out. And then all of them have these little pins. So you'll turn your binding one way or the other. This one breaks, automatically come out. This one I just lift up the tab. And then you go back in. Lock your foot down. It's not the right size. For this one. That's not to work. But when you're going downhill, you do not want to pull this up. You want it to be flat, and the reason for that is if you fall, your ski's gonna come off. If it's not and it's locked up like this, your ski may not come off, and then you get to go some more things. <laughs> so I highly recommend having it flat. The only time that I would keep this locked is if I don't have brakes, and I'm more concerned of losing my ski and harming someone, or if I'm in a no-fall zone where I don't want to have the ski come off no matter what. So that would be icy conditions on a big mountain where fall is a bigger consequence than twisting my knee. Any questions on that? Don't. Okay. And then just a quick, quick word on layering. I almost never wear long underwear. You get really hot. So I'll just wear a single layer on my bottoms. And then on the top, I usually just wear one single layer and then a really lightweight. This jacket's actually probably too warm and I never wear Gore-Tex going uphill. And then as far as the top goes, I feel like neck warmers sometimes get too hot. And then I really like a visor or a lightweight hat because you just get so warm. But sometimes I'm lazy and I'm cold and I don't want to start cold. So I'll keep all my puffy jackets on for the first 10 minutes and I'm like, I'm hot. And then take your, take your jacket off. Because once you start sweating, I mean, some of, sometimes it's inevitable you're going to sweat, but if you can reduce the amount of sweating on the uphill, you'll be able to keep your temperature regulated better, and you can throw on a jacket and have a longer, more enjoyable tour. But it, in, seriously, in a long tour, it can become a safety issue. If you get too wet, then you get cold, then you're gone, then you're far away, and can lead to hypothermia. So it is serious. On Glory, yeah, who cares? You're down in the car in 20 minutes. But other places, if you're out for six or eight hours or on a hut trip, something like that, and you get super wet, it can be super dangerous. Definitely. So think about headbands, buffs, like lighter weight. Like this hat, I think, is probably too warm for a normal day of touring. You have a really cute tooth, but probably the same. <laughs>
up the slope in relative comfort. When you get new skins. Yeah. <sighs> Good job. She needs to make a sharp turn back the other direction. So she's gonna find a nice stance, plant her lower foot so she doesn't slide out. Her Exaggerating. Poles, her poles are gonna be wide out of the way. She's gonna make that move. See how her foot's not coming super high off of the ground, but it is rotating outward. She's gonna find a good place to plant that foot. The poles are wide. And this is really stable, guys. And see how, again, going anywhere. Her foot is not going up in the air like a donkey. Show us donkey. Up high, that's donkey. It's gonna just stay nice and low against the ground and pivot around her other ski and glide through. Okay, do another one. Mm. Right. Faster? Sure, yeah, just go walk through real quick. Walking up. Poles are wide out of the way. Good stance, kick through, move. 